Well, good morning, Pathways. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Dan. I'm a friend of Brent's. I come down here a couple of times a year, and it is a joy to be with you today. Uh, since I was here last time, y'all been through some stuff. There's been a lot going on. I was talking with Brent about that, and, you know, we partner together. We talk a lot on the phone just about ministry around the country and, and what God's doing across our nation. And I was telling him that, you know, at our office we have about 25, 30 counselors, and they're psychologists, and so they study the mind a lot. And they were telling me recently that before COVID hit, so let's go back. What's that been? It feels like 16 years. So back before COVID hit, your mind on an average day made about 30, 30 35,000 decisions a day. That's what your mind does. It, little things like, for example, you walked in here this morning, where are we going to sit? You don't even think about that, but your mind's doing that. Some of y'all are already going, where are we going to go to lunch? I mean, it's just in your head. Stuff like right now, I'm not even thinking about it, but my mind's telling me, hey, you're going to walk over there and you're going to sit down on that stool. It's just the way our brain works. So about 35,000 of those kind of decisions that you're not even thinking about. Since COVID hit, the study of the mind is telling us that we're doing about 90,000 decisions a day. So it's tripled. Shoot, 10,000 of those is, where did I put that mask? I mean, it's just the way, it's the way we're living these days. And that filters down. Those of you who have children, your children are at school and at school. They've got a teacher over here who is really strong into the math stuff. And so in that room, they have to adjust their mind to, oh, that's how I need to do it in this room. But over here, this one's a little more lax. So from that class to this class, decisions change in their mind. So, of course, as children, you're going to see a little more anxiety. Uh, they're going to have things said to them that they're going to be like, wow, I, I've never experienced that before. I know some kids who have had teachers say things to them that, that have been pretty detrimental to the kid, had to get counseling for it because it's hard for them. So their minds are adjusting to that. We're all doing this all the time. And it's adding up. It's having, if you will, a domino effect throughout our society. Uh, my grandson, his name is Jackson. Jackson's seven, and so he is in the same kind of school, just like your kids. And so Jackson was uh, um, being a little smart mouth with his mom, and she was telling me about this. And I'm, of course, I'm his papa. So I was like, you know what I'll do? I'll FaceTime him and talk to him about it. He lives about, you know, 30, 40 minutes away from me. And so instead of driving over there, I said to my daughter, hey, I'll, I'll just FaceTime him and give him some good thoughts and ideas how you can cool it and not have that smart mouth with you. So I'm on the, I'm on the phone. We're FaceTiming. Uh, I'm talking first about Pokemon. Pokemon, just trying to be real cool with him and hang out. And then I, then I turned the corner and I said, Jackson, I got to talk to you about something. It's not going to be real easy for you to hear. And I said, you know, your mom's telling me you had a little smart mouth and we're going to work on that. I don't like you being smart mouth. That's not, Papa doesn't have a smart mouth and I want you to not have a smart, you know, all that stuff. And so he's, he's looking at me on the screen and every time I stop talking, he did, he's he goes, oh, mm, just nodding his head real big. And I'm thinking, man, I'm killing it. And my daughter walks in the room and takes the phone from him and said, Dad, how long you been talking to Jackson? Because he's had you muted the whole time. <laughs> That's what we do. We even sit in a service like this, and there comes that point. Where, oh, this is fun. This is good. But then that point, boom, like a dagger hits your heart, and you go, uh, mute that. I don't want to hear that because that's going to require change. Mute. And a lot of us play the mute button with God. Today I'm going to ask you to take the mute button off and listen for what His Holy Spirit will speak to you today. This is a very simple message. I'm going to tell you one thing today. I'm going to tell you the name Jesus because I got this little stool in my office and all this stuff that's going on, those 90,000 decisions that we're adjusting to and I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. I'm no prophet, but I, it feels like we're going to lock down again. It's just, it's just out there. It just feels this way to me. And I sit on this stool, and I have this little stool in the office, and I'm like, Lord, what do you want me to talk about? You know, I go down the pathways. The people there are feeling the same thing I'm feeling. What do they need to hear from you? Because I'm just a mouthpiece. 
And I was sitting on this little stool in my office, and I just felt like the Lord put this verse on my heart. I shared it with Brent. I know he, he even shared the verse with you, but it's John 14, 6, where Jesus is speaking, and he said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Now, us preachers love that verse because that's the verse we use for salvation, baby. It's like, there is no other way to God the Father except through Jesus, and it's his words. Love it. But when Jesus spoke, there was always deeper meaning. Like, there were times he would say something to his disciples, and they would look at each other like, what's he talking about? I mean, I know he's talking about the vine and all this stuff, but what's that mean? Because way deeper meaning. And that day in my office... I kept saying the verse, Jesus said, I am the way. And, and this is what started happening to me. I felt like the Lord just laid on my heart, tell people, I am the way through a pandemic. I, I am the way through an election, whether or not you like the results. I am the way. Um, somebody sitting in here this morning, I am the way for them to figure out how to work their marriage out. Tell some teen in here today, I am the way for them to be secure about who they are as a person. That's what I just felt like the Lord kept saying into my heart. Because all you are his children and there's some spot where you need a little way in your life. Now, i got to tell you where this story comes from. Jesus is telling this, and most of us, when I, when I say, let me tell you the setting where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He was at the Last Supper, that thing we celebrate when we come together and we have communion. That's where Jesus was, in the upper room with his 12 disciples. Um, and we have a picture in our mind. Some of you have it at your house. Uh, I went out to the flea market out on the interstate uh, in the last couple of days. And as I was walking around, the picture was there. I took a picture of it to show you. This is the picture that you have when you think about the upper room. It's out at your flea market. You can go pick this up for like, I don't know, 50 bucks. So I saw this picture. I'm like, that's it. See, we get, that's the picture we have. Look at the laid back. They look peaceful. We always look at the picture and go, which one's Judas? <laughs> right? I want to I get rid of that picture. So I want it to go away. And I want to put more of a reality picture, okay? I want y'all to go into the room with me. It was an upper room. The room's still there. You can Google it up. You can see it's historical place. And, and I want you just to be with the 12 disciples. We've been walking a lot. Oh, we're having dinner with Jesus. He knows it's the Last Supper. We have a real advantage in the church, those of us who have grown up in the church, because we know what the Last Supper means. But if you were there at the Last Supper and you're one of the disciples, you be that person today. You don't fully get what's happening in this moment. And Jesus is saying some really weird stuff. It's not as relaxed as it looks in that picture. Jesus is saying stuff like this. Y'all just imagine you're in the room and Jesus says this. Um, hey, guys. We've been traveling around, having a lot of fun together, but I'm about to go away, and where I'm going, you can't come. What? Peter, Peter, real quick mouth. I'll go with you to the ends of the earth. Don't tell me I won't follow you. I've been following you everywhere. Don't tell me I can't come. I'll follow you till I die. And, and Jesus looks at him and says, Peter, actually... You're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. Now, come on, y'all. If y'all are in the room with me, where's the, there ain't no rooster even in this room. What is he talking about? There got to be a couple of disciples in the back going, he's had a little too much to drink. I mean, it's just not making any sense. He's talking about a rooster crowing. Y'all know the story, but if you didn't, imagine a few days later when... Peter hears the rooster crowing, what that must have felt like. Cock -doo -doo, and him going, oh my word, I'm denying him right now. I mean, it's crazy stuff is happening in this room. And then Jesus says this, and, and boys, listen, um, I'm going to be handed over, flogged, and I'm, I'm going to be killed. And, and one of you is going to be the one that causes that to happen. Yeah, be in the room a second. That's tense. And then somebody says, which one's it going to be, Jesus? And Jesus says, the one I'm about to hand this to. 
Can you imagine? I would have been like, no thanks, whatever he hands me. I'm like, I don't want it. Well, take this bread. No, pass it to Judas. I don't want it. I ain't touching that. This is tense. See, we get this perfect little image of everybody in that photo laid back. Who's Judas? Over there, pass him the bread. I mean, that's not what it was like. I mean, I think the Bible says Judas got up and left the room. Can you imagine everybody going, dude, can you believe? It's tense. And in that tension, Jesus says, I am the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. He was saying to them, they did not know. Some of them are going to be crucified upside down. And Jesus was letting them know, when that day comes for you, I'm the way. So I transfer right now to 2020 and tell you you're in this room. And according to Jesus, in that same storyline from John 14 and 15, that's where Jesus said he will send the Holy Spirit, the advocate, in this room with us right now, right now. And he sees the tension of our world. He sees the chaos of 2020. He knows that these days information can be sent to us instantaneously, chaotic information, worrisome information. I mean, how often do you get an alarm going off going, hey, just so everybody knows, peaceful day, beautiful outside? No. Now, when this thing goes off, it's, oh, no, that's terrible. Oh, no. And then walk outside. It looked pretty good till I looked at this. And in the middle of this chaotic world, Jesus looks at all you today and he says to you, I am the way through whatever it is that's going on in your life. You don't need to sweat, worry, and look chaotic because I am your peace. And I want to give you a couple things he said there in my mind. Jesus said, number one, I am the way to a solid, peaceful family and marriage life no matter what's going on in it. If, if one of you today could walk up here and say, Dan, let me explain to you what I'm going through. Okay, come on. Start telling me. Paint the worst scenario. Just start speaking the worst scenario, what's going on in your life. Tell me right now. I will look right at you. I promise you, I will look right at you. I will not say, oh, that's easy. I won't do that because some of you are going through a really hard spot. But I will look at you and I will say back to you, Having been a man who's been through some hell myself, I can promise you, Jesus is your hope in the spot you're in. Nobody in here today is in a spot that Jesus is in heaven going, I'm wringing my hands over that one. He's got you. Now, people may have let you down. A friend may have let you down. But Jesus has you right now. And I'm going to invite you to do something with that spot in your life. I, I want to illustrate something I used to say. In fact, I've corrected it. I've been preaching now for over 30 years. And when I first began to preach, I would say something. And I still believe this. I just want to explain it. I would say this phrase in a sermon like this. At this point in the sermon when I'm talking to you about that spot in your life, I would say something like this. Just ask Jesus into your life. He'll fill you up. That's the line I would use. He'll fill you up. And I do believe that. But I don't believe it happens overnight. I want to show you what I mean. Some of you here today don't even know Jesus. Your life, in my mind, is empty. I want to tell you that right now, as I look at our world, I see a chaotic, empty world that needs a feeling of Jesus. That's what I see. And in our personal lives, forget about the nation, come down to your individual life. Some of you need to splash Christ. Into, you said, I want to be filled with Christ. I want you to be filled with Christ, but it starts with a splash. Beginning to give your life over to him. We call this process sanctification, when your life is fully surrendered to Christ. Let, let me show you. Some of you are in this very spot today. You have Jesus in your life, but you got a whole lot of self in there too. And this right here is where the chaos is. This right here is where the peace is. 
I've been walking with the Lord for 40 years. And if I had to illustrate where I think I am, after 40 years of pouring Jesus into my life, I, I, I would say maybe a little over half, maybe. Dan, you're not perfect. Mm -mm. You got areas in your life where you have sinful behaviors? Yeah. Yeah. And my goal is to keep identifying those places and, and, and pouring Jesus in that. And today, I want you to look at your life and I want you to identify that spot where there's chaos, where there's fear, where there's worry. And I want you to say, Jesus, today, I believe that you are the way through that. I'm tired of watching the dominoes of this world lead to the domino of me falling. I, I'm going to pour you into that spot. You get to pick the spot. I have no idea what it is today. I just know today, today I'm here to tell you, Jesus says, and, and do y'all remember the woman at the well? He, he said to her, oh, if you, if you drink the water I give, ma'am, you won't ever be thirsty again. It's funny, he used the analogy of water. And so today... Pour Jesus in that place where you need peace. In, in that place of your marriage. This cup's getting a little too full. And I want you to keep looking at your life and saying, where do I need that? Because Jesus, secondly, he is the way to have guidance in your life. <laughs> um. I had this guy named Brian. He texted me. It's probably been three weeks now. Uh, Brian texted me on my phone to say, hey, Dan, can I talk to you? I need some guidance. I said, okay. Texted him back. Sure, call me. Call me. I said, what's up, B? He's like, can I come to your office? I said, sure, no problem. I'll be there. I was, I was out and about. I said, I'll meet you there in 30 minutes. Okay, great. Came to my office. I know Brian. I've known him for a while. We sit in my office. Um, I sit behind my desk. He sits right across. He starts talking. I listen to him for 20, 25 minutes at least, telling me about a situation he's facing in his family, just like you would. I listened the whole time. We got done, and he did. He, he said to me what gets said to me a lot. Um, Dan, now, tell me what to do. Tell me what to do. I looked right back at him, and I said, Brian, I don't need to. You know what to do. Why don't you tell me what you already know you should do? So he said, shoot. I said, why did you say shoot? He goes, I was hoping you'd give me something else. <laughs> That's us, isn't it? So, so last week, Jesus spoke to me very clear, and I left the service. But this week, Jesus, I'm coming. Give me some guidance. Jesus, give me some guidance. Well, I did last week. But I, I didn't really like that one. <laughs> Can you give me another op an option that maybe is a little more in my favor? I, I, I want to just tell you something. I set you up by saying Jesus will give you guidance in your life. Uh, he will, but I frankly don't think today most of us need more guidance in our life. I think most of us need more obedience in our life. Amen. Like right now, without me preaching another word you know something that you could hit these exits and go and do that would draw you closer to Christ. Go do that before you ask him for more. Those of you who have children, have you ever said to them, just do what I told you for now and I'll let you know the other later. <laughs> and that's what we do. Thank you for whoever pushed that button right. That was good. And I just want to say to you today, be obedient to what you know you need to do. Today, whatever the Lord is laying on your heart, obey it. Brian didn't need more gu guidance from me. He needed more obedience in his own walk. Today, you say to me, Dan, you're, you're telling me that you have an empty part of your glass? Yeah. I don't really need Jesus to show me more. I already see some of my empty holes. I already know some places I need him to fill. I, I need to spend more time there before I ask for more. And I want to tell you, and I want to leave you with this thought. This is really big to me. 
Jesus was saying to his disciples that day, guys, y'all don't know y'all's future, but I do. And I want you to know you're going to have to distrust that I am the way, the truth, the life. And I think one of the things Jesus was saying to them was this. It's a very important statement. If I leave here today and y'all get this statement, this was a killer good sermon. It's this thought. Jesus is the one sure thing that you can count on. It's coming up on the screen. The truth is Christ is the one sure thing that you can count on. In fact, my little stool in my office, right? I, uh, I sat on it for quite a while as the Lord began to lay this message on my heart. And I sat on the stool and I wrote down the things that we count on. Okay, the things that we as people, our nation, our world, uh, these are the things that we have put in our minds and in our hearts and we make ads about saying, if you get this, then you're good. And I wanna show you how every one of them fails. The first one I wrote down was stuff and money. There are a lot of people right now who are chasing money and things. And if I could just get it. Once I attain this amount, I'll just be good. And I, 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 I travel and speak a lot. Y'all know that. And I've had the privilege of speaking at some crazy places. And one of them would be a place where I remember speaking where everybody in the room was a multimillionaire. So stinking wealthy. The setting we were in, um, like, you know, I can look comfortable even when I'm uncomfortable. Everybody there was dressed in $1,000 suits. You know, I got on mine from JCPenney. I'm, I'm fine. I'm good or whatever. This is just me. But I remember being in that room going, I don't have these people's money. I don't have these people's fame. These people are, in the world's eyes, the world would call them shooters. And it was really funny after I spoke that day to that group, probably about 100, wealthy beyond belief. Can, can I, Dan, can I talk to you for just a second? Sure, sure. What do you want to talk about? Well, walk over here. Don't, don't want to do it out and come over here. Where, well, where do you want to talk? Well, let's try to find some place where somebody can't see us. Well, where do you want to go? Let's go back in here. Why do you want to go back here? I don't want anybody to know that I don't have it all figured out. Well, I think us hiding over here might tell them. Because <laughs> money... Money doesn't, money's not a sure thing. Second thing I wrote down, here's something that'll never let you down, your spouse. <laughs> Somebody's sitting in here today and you remember, might have even got married here and will you? Yes, forever, oh yes. Promise, mm-hmm, pinky ring, pinky ring and a ring. And you're sitting here today alone. And you're hurting. And even when I say Jesus is a sure thing, it crosses your mind. Yeah, I thought my spouse was too. I'm not sure I can count on Jesus, same as I couldn't count on them. Let me just say again, Jesus does not and will not let you down. Spouses fail. Jesus won't. I, I'm telling y'all, I sit on the stool in my office and I'm going, Lord, but Lord, how do I say this in a way that they get it? Just keep saying my name. Let them know I'm the real deal. <laughs> that next thing I wrote down, best friend, BFF. Got the BFF bracelet, BFF. I got the one with the heart that matches. Got a tattoo, BFF. In fact, I got a new best friend, now I got two BFFs. <laughs> got the whole legs, BFF and all over the place. Best friends let you down. And when best friends let you down, they know how you tick. So then they know how to post something that really hurts you. Wow. Somebody in here, you know, you've heard me say something like this. You've heard Pastor Brent, Jesus is a friend at all times. You go, <laughs> I had one of those. Jesus won't screw you over. He'll stick by you. Peter failed him, but Jesus didn't fail Peter.
parents. Boy, parents will never let, let's just keep going. <laughs> job. How'd that work out with COVID? Somebody in here lost your job during that season, and it's not a sure thing. Education. Boy, you get that, you get the right degree. Mm-mm. No. You're not, you're not going to get to the pearly gates and, 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 well, what degree do you have? Well, I have a doctorate. Well, come on. No, that won't matter there. It's not a sure thing. It's good for this world. It's awesome. But it's not a heavenly requirement. And for those of us like me who aren't very smart, thank you, Jesus, for not making that part of the deal. One of my favorite things is when Jesus went around and picked his 12 disciples, he wasn't looking for degrees. He was looking for obedience. Tap my talent, something that will never fail, my talents. Dan, if you could see me sing, it's going to pass. You know, I, I have a throat and a voice, and so far God's allowed me to keep it. But if he chooses to take it, I won't be able to travel down here and preach like this. My talent will be gone that I use for the Lord. But, but watch this. Your talent may leave you, but your relationship with Jesus does not. L- listen, if I lost my voice and could never preach again at Pathways Church, I'm good because I'm God's kid. I don't need the talent to be his kid. I'm his kid because I'm his child. Because I've said, Jesus, I want to be your child. I want to be part of your kingdom. Today, you don't have to jump through any hoops to know that Jesus has got you other than believing he is the way, the truth, and the life. And finally, I wrote down physical appearance. Boy, you can count on that. Not so much. In fact, it's kind of a crazy thought, but I was, you know, we live in a world right now, man, you can tuck it, you can paste it, you can staple it, you can suck it. There's a lot of stuff you can do to this body. But I was thinking about this. When you get 80 and you stand in there naked, you look 80, man. That's just all there is to it. (laughs) I don't care what you did to it. You stand in there, people are going to go, nope, nope. (laughs) Even Dolly, nope, nope. Because physical appearance will let you down. Listen to me very carefully. Somebody sitting in here today, Jesus is with you right now. Don't you give up and don't you think that you failed to a place God can't cover you. He's got you and he's got you this morning and I came to tell you that. And I want you to listen to this little song. I've asked Scott and the team to sing a little song beautiful little song y'all know it as it's being sung reflect on your own life for a second at the end of the song I'm going to come out and pray and I want you to use this song as a meditation time to say what is in where is it in my life I'll just leave you with this picture where is it in your life that you need to pour in a splash of Jesus open your heart don't mute it open your heart to wherever he would want to do that, even right now.